Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to our talk, Titan Bridge to Coexist, Nurturing Coexistence Between Humans and Monkeys in Penang. Before we dive into the fascinating world of harmonious coexistence between humans and monkeys, let me introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Jolene Yap, who has an impressive list of credentials. She holds a PhD in zoology, who is also a wildlife researcher and environmental educator. Dr. Jolene headed the Lango Project Penang LLP, LPP, and she is also part of the esteemed IUCN Human Private Interaction Specialist Group. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jolene Yap. Hi everyone, thank you so much for spending your evening with us, Joey and myself, so I really appreciate it. And some of you actually attended our talk back a few years ago, like two years ago. So there's lots of updates for this slide, so breathe in, breathe out, because I have been non-stop speaking since 9am, uh, so I'm going to go to autopilot mode, so get, get ready for that. Uh, just, just joking, I try to speak a little bit slower. <laughs> Alright, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the progress of Langer Project Penang, the social-based enterprise that I have established. So the title of the talk today is Bridge to Coexist, Nurturing Coexistence Between Humans and Monkeys in Penang. So why is coexistence so important? I want all of you to keep this term in your mind. Coexistence happens among yourself with your neighbours, with your family members, among your house pets, as well as humans and the wildlife residents around us. But we're going to narrow down the skill. Don't talk about the whole Malaysia first. Let's think about Penang, as most of us were from Penang, right? So let's dive in into today's topic about coexistence. Just wait a second. Okay. All right. So thank you so much for MC for introduce my name and myself. Just call me Joe from now on, or Jojo the Explorer, as you like. Yeah. So I'm also a certified Malaysian regional tour guide. Yeah? I have a green badge. Yeah. So if you're interested to learn more about uh, how to collaborate in terms of environmental education at the end of this presentation, please speak with us later on. I know it's a bit blurry, all right, unfortunately, so you can't really see the images over here. So basically, on this slide, it consists of monkeys of all sorts of colors and sizes, all right? To be precise, would be primates, all right? Primates consist of human, monkeys, and apes, yeah? All right? And in Malaysia, we have actually an impressive biodiversity of primate species. Guess what? Ta-da! The whole list with the scientific name. Confusing, right? Let me sum it up. Malaysia is a home to 26 species of primates. Ayah, 26 species only, so what? In this room, maybe more than 26 people already. Lah. But Malaysia is actually the second country after Indonesia with 60 species of primates. And come after Indonesia would be Malaysia with 26. And then Vietnam, 25 species. So Malaysia is indeed enriched with primate biodiversity. We have the only eight great ape species in Southeast Asia, the orangutans, and alongside various leaf monkeys, macaques, and also lots of elusive and cryptic species. If you're interested, drop by our booth later. We have the guidebook of all 26 species of primates on this handbook, yeah? Okay. Okay, how about narrow down to primates in Penang? What are the primate species we can find in Penang? Aha, uh -huh. so everyone familiar with Dusky Langer, right? Orange baby, uh, the, with the white spectacle adults, and then we have the long tail macaque, am I right? Third, we have the Sunda slow loris, which are the nocturnal primates you can find in Peninsula Malaysia, also in Penang and Penang Island. And then the silvery langer, okay? They are also lean monkeys but without the white spectacle. You can't find them on Binning Island, only native in Sabrang Brai, okay? But we still have two more. Can you guess? Gibbon? Unfortunately, we do not have Gibbon in Penang. Used to have, but then habitat loss organization. Mm, we'll talk more about it later. The answer is Tada! 
All right, you have humans, right? Never forget humans are also primates. But are we really native or we are actually invasive? Hmm. And also introduce species of primates that you can find in Sabrang Barai, which they are not supposed to be found native in Penang, the big tail macaque, or you call them the baroque. All right. Yeah, Gura is the long tail macaque with the long tail. The brown color you can find in Botanical Garden one. And the burro is the one with the short tail, looks like pig tail, yeah? Like here, it's a bit blurry, but after that, go to our booth, we have very clear photo. Yes, sir? Burro is B-E-R-U-K, burro. Malay word. Yes, English name is pig tail macaque, because the tail looks like pig tails, okay? So let me introduce a little bit about uh, our project. It's known as Langer Project Penang. So we are a community science based primate conservation social enterprise. What does it mean? So basically we work with community members and we are a self-sufficient enterprise that aim to cultivate coexistence through three pillars. First, citizen science based fieldwork. Second, road canopy bridge installation, which I'm going to show you photo later on and the environment education all right so we work on these three different pillars basically what we do is we identify planning and assess the field sites like when people would call us like oh there's monkeys come to my house and we will go there we would assess explore and survey and take a while we will come out with a report to evaluate the type of interaction happening between humans and monkeys in the urban area or different types of habitats and then we come up with conservation actions mitigation plan or enhancement in terms of the habitat condition or even restoration of habitats and as well perform education and awareness campaign for the local residents and tourists around Penang and Malaysia all right so for this talk I'm going to give you three case studies that we're working on at the moment. Three different projects that we're working on. First is Alai's Crossing. Some of you may already heard about it. <laughs> All right, why Alai? Eh? Alai is actually the first monkey that I have studied. Yeah, so I named him Alai. And he inspired me to build a bridge for monkey to cross the road. So the first project started back in 2019. Yeah, known as Alai's, the Alai's Crossing. And second, Nurturing Concord. The other meaning of Concord is uh, harmony. So it's nurturing harmony among humans and dusky langers. And this field site of the second project is happening in Tanjung Bunga. And the third, very interesting name, yeah? Green Light District. Why? So this is the field site that located in Sabrang Brai, where we do our best in tackling waste management and monkey feeding issues. All right, and I'm going to go through the three projects briefly because we only have like 50 minutes of your time. So if you're interested to know more, go to our booth later and we'll speak more. Okay, let's look at Alai Crossing. So this is a canopy bridge, as you can see over here. Later, I'll show you more photos and more photos at our booth. So we installed this canopy bridge back in 2019 through years of field work in the forest and on the ground by identifying the location where the monkey crossed the road, where the monkey got hit by car, where the monkey got electrocuted by the cable wire or electric pole, all right? So this was the situation back then when we follow the monkeys through the forest to understand where they live, how do they move, and what do they feed on, and what drives them to actually go to the roadside to feed on the roadside plants and coastal plants. So this brings us to one of the important threats towards wildlife in Malaysia, not only in Penang. Habitat fragmentation. In Penang, when you see it's surrounded by hills, so many green ma. Where got habitat loss? Most people would think that way. But we must identify the separation of the green space as fragmentation. So this fragmentation, for example, a road cutting through a coastal way in Telopahang is also identified as habitat fragmentation. 
And habitat fragmentation is the beginning of urbanization, where people will have more contact with wild animals. Elephant goes into kampong, tapio goes into shopping mall. Remember those news or not? All this started from habitat fragmentation. All right, and for monkeys, right? Regardless of cats or langurs or squirrels uh, that live on the treetops, uh, they would have to cross the road in order to cope with habitat fragmentation. So they live in the forest in a very, very good way. They can leap from tree to trees and sleep on the trees, live in such a harmonious way. But when their habitat is fragmented, they would have to spend time by the road, even mimic us already. Look to the left, look to the right, look to the left again, let me cross the road. Seriously, they do that. If there's no tree connectivity by the road, they would have to run across the road. So back in 2016, when we started that field site of Alai Crossing, we observed their travelling data. And we decided we have to do something, right? So we wanted to build a canopy bridge for them to cross. So the objective basically is to see whether canopy bridge works or not, whether they will use or not. If they use, what animal will use? So these are the objective of the canopy bridge project. We successfully developed the first prototype back in 2019, a single line. It's a bit blur over here, yeah? More photos at the booth. And then we reinforced the same bridge into second prototype. And these two are one year gap. Why? Why can't we do it immediately? It's because to compare the data. So that we have the data to show that the second design is indeed better compared to the first design. So this was a collaboration among different stakeholders. We have approval from JKR and also from the uh, state office and also from the land office as well. And we work with uh, different social enterprises and NGO to get the bridge up. We also install a camera on the bridge so that we are able to observe what animal use the bridge as our visual data. So far, we are proud to announce that there's more than 5,000 animals use that bridge at the location in Telopaha of Alai's Crossing. So I named that bridge after the first dusky langer that I learned how to recognize in the field site, Alai. He was the one that crossed the road that gave me the inspiration of doing something more impactful rather than just doing a PhD writing a thesis, right? Okay. Become your pet, lah. Uh, no, it's not my pet. We are like, uh, you know, just know each other. Lah. Yeah, <laughs> but no touching, no feeding, no anything. Why no feeding? Later I'll explain more. And our bridge got international coverage as well, uh, featured on BBC back in the 2020, BBC Primates, and the result were published yeah, on International Journal, one of the renowned journal Folia Primatologica. Yeah, based in the Netherlands, yeah. Yeah. So that was the first case study, Allies Crossing. Since the establishment of the bridge, after I done with my PhD, and then I realized that, hmm, it's time to tackle human issue. So conservation is not about keeping animals at home, protect them so that people don't kill them. It's not like that. It's about science communication, talk to people and work with people to tackle the problem. So this was the inspiration of the second project that I'm going to explain to you all. Huh? Nurturing Concord. Anyone lives near Taman Concord or Lembah Permai? So that's our second field site of this study, Nurturing Concord. Why? Sorry. So this project is funded by CNB Islamic and in collaboration with the Habitat Foundation. So the slogan of this project is bridging the gap, one resident and one canopy bridge at a time, means the ultimate objective of this study is also to build the canopy bridge and also to educate one resident at a time. So I mentioned this now, the overall aims of this project is to work with the community, educate residents, and to reduce food kill incident of the arboreal wildlife in Tanjung Bunga which is to tackle roadkill. So we have multiple objectives. Lah. I'm just going to summarize to you all. Basically, is to work with the people over there. Auntie, uncle, when do you see the monkeys come to your house? Ah? Oh, this is a date and time right now. 
when they come to your house, how they come to your house, huh? which part of your house they can jiao, huh? So all these are the drivers, the attractor, that attract the monkey go to their house. So all this information is very important because all these are the interaction hotspot that help us to identify the issue and come up with strategies and also to see which area the monkeys wanted to cross the road but cannot cross. Because that area is basically fragmented. There's a huge development opposite. Eh? If uh, you all know Tembi School, eh? Tembi School, that road, that the Mira resident and the quarry over there, the monkey can't cross over. So they are trapped in the Bapamai and Concord area. So the monkeys over there, they are very kasihan because they just have nowhere to go. If they cross the road, they get hit by cars. Because the Bapamai from out of skin, the car moves too fast already. So this is the field site. Eh? This is what I men men mentioned. No? The monkeys, they move around this area on top and they will divide so we're here. And they couldn't hello and they couldn't cross to the opposite side means they lost their connectivity so this happened when Pahiritan Pinin contacted us to communicate with the residents and then we spoke to them that let's take this site as one of the case study of our project so that we can work with the community member to identify the drivers why the dusky Langer decided to go there and what we can help so we work with the citizen scientists that we recruited, the small working group that we established, and we get data on the traveling routes of the monkeys, and we take photos of them visiting the resident house, and we even do a plant inventory around the residential area, what type of plants that you plant at home can be attracted to the monkey itself. And so, we managed to identify the negative interaction, the drivers and attractors that the monkey decided to visit different houses. So some of the negative interaction includes cable wire walking and feeding on resident food plant. Oh, this one a lot of people complain, oh, my mango, I just fruiting only and the monkey eat, oh, I have nothing to eat, how ah? And also playing on the air conditioning, they like to sleep on the compressor because it's warm, oh, so, so cool, so nice. Ah? And they would sitting near to the housing window, peek inside, see oh what's inside, huh? what what's inside, huh? So all these are the negative interaction. And it doesn't end there. There's a whole list, and this is just a summary. They even play on the lamb, playing on the ground, even curious about the waste over there, the plastic, and playing on the rooftop. So these are the complaints uh, the residents would inform us. And we will identify the complaints and also observe the behavior of the monkey. So are these monkeys aggressive? Are these monkeys have to be trapped and translocated? Or they just need extra help and understanding and empathy from all of us? So we managed to create a stakeholder report. Yeah? I'm only able to summarize for this talk, but if you're interested, I'm able to share you the report. The report is around 35 pages. Lah, and it consists of uh, the results of the activity budget, like uh, how the monkeys spend their time, and second, the home range signs, how big the Taman area they cover. And third, the diet composition. Each house has different plants that attract the dusky langers to their places. And lastly, we interview the residents. Some have positive experience with the monkey, some have negative perception. So we gather all their highlights and keywords to see how they deal with such interaction. So these are some of the result graphs that we display on the report. So on the left is basically the pie chart that shows how they spend their time. On the top left is the activity, how much of the time they spend on feeding, playing and foraging, for example. And bottom left is what they eat. A lot of people think that big monkeys only eat leaves. Oh. No, they also feed on fruits and flowers. And from my PhD study, right, that consists of three different star study sites, yeah, they feed mainly on leaves, 63%. But for urban dusky lander, the highest percentage is actually fruit. Yeah, like in Concord would be rambutan, mango, yeah, these two lah. Yeah, because they don't have a lot of native plants to feed on. Yeah, and on the right is basically the charts that shows their home range. And also the bottom right yeah, is the hot spot. If you see the red color dots, yeah, those are the areas that the monkey likes to hang around. So those areas helps us to identify which part of their home range can be enriched in terms of connectivity. All right. So this is a summary of the resident thoughts. Yeah. So how do people actually chase them away? Some residents use fireworks. 
ah, throw to them. Some even use smoke. They start the fire and then the smoke to deter them. And then disturb other residents as well. And some even use dogs as a monkey garden. And they also describe some of the impact that leads disturbances to their housing area. And also their perception and their perception towards members of LPP. All right, why this project is so important? Basically, is to observe the movement of the Langers, what can be done. So basically, from the outcome of the report that we have created, we identify the issues and we propose three different approaches. First, work with the community to use different strategy towards the identified conflict. Second, build canopy bridge so that the Langers that trap in Lumba Perma and Concord able to enhance their movement towards the other side of the habitat. We can't guarantee the monkeys won't go back. They may go back, but reduce the frequency of going back because their home range is getting bigger. And third, enrichment of corridors. Enough mixed species of native trees or even fruit plants and give them more choices in order to feed and move around at the area that we wanted them to, from the graphs, the red spot that we identified. So these three approaches enable us to improve the relationship between humans and monkeys. Yeah? So what's happening next? Next, after the state election, uh, we're going to proceed with the canopy bridge permit and also installation, and also organize a discussion forum with the communities and the stakeholders, Pohutanan, uh, Pahitan, and then to talk more about the collaboration opportunities in trying to promote coexistence. Okay, so that's the second case study. Now the third one, which is the most interesting one. This is the new project that we're going to start officially in 1st of August. But now, I'm just going to give you some sneak peek where we already done some survey and exploration. Green Light District. Why Green Light District? Very funny name, huh? yeah, Everyone knows Red Light District, right? So later I explain you, you understand it, huh? <laughs> so this picture tells all, uh, human walk past and then the monkey just come like, oh, you mean? So, this project is to enhance the communication between hikers, animal feeders, and mediators like us to tackle negative human attack interaction. So right now, Langer Project Penang doesn't only work on Langer, we also work on macaques. Not only one species of macaque, but two species of macaque, the long tail and the big tail. Alright, so this study is sponsored by uh, Animal Protection Denmark and also supported by the Long Tail Macaque Project, an international charity uh, based in Denmark. Yeah, so basically it's to promote coexistence and understanding from human to long tail macaques. For information, long tail macaque has been exploited for experimental purpose, medical experimental purpose, and normally for complaints uh, that filed by the resident to the wildlife department. Sometimes uh, trap and transportation can be done, but uh, sometimes culling also being decided by the authority. So why they are endangered species? For information, long tail macaques they are endangered, and not many people understand why they are endangered because botanical garden they just around. So their population so many, or oh, how come they are endangered? Carry on with the slide, and you understand. So green light district, humans paying the monkey. So if you have fed monkey before, it's okay. I fed monkey before when I was in primary school. When my teacher took me to Botanical Garden, we fed monkeys over there because we don't know. So all these photos are taken in different parts of Penang. So people are leaving food for the long tail macaques. So it's feeding them a good thing to do. Some people will say that, ah, feed them someone will clean up the mess. But it's not the case. When you feed monkey, it will cause a lot of negative consequences. From the previous survey that we have done in the feeding spot in Sabrang Brai, we noticed that the behavior of the macaques has been changing. They would overcrowd. This term, uh, overcrowding, uh, explain why you see so many macaques in Penang Botanical Garden. Because you imagine, if you start to feed the macaques, they will know like 1 p.m. uncle, you will feed them. And then 3 p.m. you will feed them. And then before 1 p.m. Uh, they're very children, you know. Huh? 12, 5, 50, they will stay there and then wait, wait for you already. Wait for their feeder already. So 
They will be very lazy. They will overcrowd in a certain area just to wait for you. Wait for you to arrive to scatter food. So this is known as overcrowding. This is why you have the perception of monkeys are so many. It's not that there are so many, it's because there are so many at that spot only. <laughs> you know what I mean or not? But in the four forest, they are not there and they are just coming out. If you experience seeing wild long tail macaque, yeah, means those that are not familiar with people, yeah, no one feed them, yeah, they are very afraid of humans. Yeah. When we go to feel in the forest, we see the long tail macaque that never being fed by human. They heal our footsteps already, they, they will leap away already. But those that in areas that people feed them, they will overcrowd. And for normal monkeys, once they wake up, they will carry on with their life, like the dusky langer over there, move from tree to tree, feed, play, move, and then 12 hours pass, go back to sleep again. But for them, they can spend like 6 hours, 8 hours out of the 12 hours of the day, just sitting on the ground, do nothing. And what would they do? They will copulate, lah. they will mate, lah. and then they will have dispute, lah, aggression. Fight here, fight there, and then mate. Eventually more babies, huh? And then this is why you see so many babies and so many mama and so many papa around certain part of Botanic Garden or Hill Park. And this case is in Jirotukun. Ah, this is why overcrowding is the reason that people have the perception of so many monkeys. Why are they endangered? Ah, they are killed, never mind. Lah. Seriously, that people say that. So think about it. Why? Why people would mention all these different opinions regarding this species? Disease. If you can see the photo clearly, uh, the female macaque uh, is not pregnant, you know. Jip Hong, uh, bloated. It's due to wrong food. So they would wait for the feeder to come out from the meditation center and then throw a bag of noodles by the road. And the macaque, oh, okay, eat, 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 eat. But it's already sick. We even spotted some individual with tumor around the genitals area, and some with fungal disease already. All this is just the outbreak, you know. We're just waiting for the ticking bomb to explode. Then later, when there's negative interaction, they attack human due to they thought you would give them food, and then you have the disease transmission like herpes, monkey malaria, etc. So it's more serious than than you thought, yeah? So it's very important for us to take note of this. And the worst thing is uh, rubbish. Because once you feed a single animal, the other animal will come already. This will have stray dogs, stray cats, pigeons, crow, flies, snakes, all sorts of animals that used to be just nice animals and now we decided to label them as pests. So who is the pest? Alright. So these are the photos that we have taken and it's very interesting. Remember the second case study regarding people complaining about the dusky langer, right? In this study site, people actually complain about the feeders. So we are working with the fruit vendors. The fruit vendors over there are actually very nice. They don't let people to feed the monkeys. So we ask for their help to identify the feeders for us so that we can use interview approach to learn more regarding their motivation behind feeding and what we can do to tackle their motivation into good motivation. Alright? So these are some of the photos that we have been working on. So we engage with the community, teach the hikers how to deal with monkeys. Because not many hikers know how to walk past a group of monkeys. Eh? Who experienced walk past a group of monkeys before? Feel scared or No scared, uncle good. Eh? Some young people, eh? They see it, like, oh, and then show teeth, uh, all that. Because uh. monkey language is very different, right? If you see, look at them like that, uh, they will think that you are challenging them. Look into their eyes. Alright? And then if you open your mouth, uh, they will thought that you are warning them. If they open their mouth, they are actually warning you. And if you show your teeth, they will thought that you are showing them submissive behaviour. So of course they will take advantage of you. So we teach the residents, we have the huge poster in front of our book, how to deal with monkeys when you're tracking. Alright, these are some of the examples lah, that I mentioned just now. Alright, safe distance, no eye contact, no feeding. I really hope that Pinning Hill can install more similar signages on different parts of hills, yeah? Because it's just a matter of time before negative interaction happens. Seriously, just a matter of time. Do not wait until that moment happens, then the monkey will get killed. Alright?
So our upcoming plans uh, is to identify the key areas where people feed the macaques in Sabrang Brai in Jotukun, and second, to create interactive posters and pamphlets for children and hikers, and third, to work with the Pinning Forestry to come out with more educational program in Jotukun, and fourth, of course, to have more volunteers to be the eyes and ears against the feeder. So for this project, we're still looking for volunteers. If you're interested to help us for this third green light district project in the Jotokun, please come to us and speak more regarding uh, uh, how you can contribute. Yeah. Okay. So wow, quite fast. Huh? I only uh, only took me like 37 minutes. Yeah, I'm a speed talker. So if you want more information, you can let me know. And you know. This girl, right, yeah, she approached me back in de December and then she told me that she has an aquatic science background and then she wanted to, you know, find a job, especially in conservation, but in Malaysia is not so much opportunity. So I decided to hire her and then she has been working with me for uh, seven months already and continue her contract until September next year. So I really like to empower youth because uh, I'm from a conservation background and I'm not that old, right? And <laughs> I really hope, hope that there's more youth will come forward to conservation field in Malaysia. So right now, I'm going to contribute my next 10 minutes. So take your time huh, to Joey, the project executive of Langer Project Penang, to share a little bit about her experience working with Langer Project Penang. Give her some motivation. Thank you, Jolene. So, good evening, everyone. So maybe just let's start with an uh, introduction of myself. So my name is um, Joey. So yeah, I'm a fresh grad from UCSI uh, with a degree in aquatic science. And I really love marine world and I like diving and I know that's nothing related to monkey. <laughs> so I'm here to share with you guys my journey with LPP. So just uh, let's recall back how I first entered LPP. So uh, back then I was doing my uh, final year project at home and then I just think that I need to earn some side income during my free time. And then I saw LPP was hiring a project assistant part-time and then with flexible hours and in Penang. And then I think like, oh, it's all like fit my requirement. And then I think I just apply and then to see where it will fit me to luck. And then I just got uh, accepted. And also, I also want to uh, take this opportunity to see what's the difference between marine conservation and terrestrial conservation. So, and then I little did I know this decision has led me to here, standing right here, sharing my journey with you all. Yeah. So, I can say that, uh, yeah, every time I uh, go to field work, I feel, I still feel very fresh, uh, even now I'm already in 7 months in LBP. Every time I go to field work, it feels like my first day working because I can honestly say that uh, nature never feels to amaze me. So, uh, every time we get to see, uh, it's very unpredictable, no matter the weather, and we always feel with like, um, new and interesting observation. Sometimes we uh, often get like observation, uh, unexpected observation, uh, apart from the groups of monkey that we are focusing. So sometimes when we, when I can't find the groups of langur that I should be following, then I will, I don't know it's fate or what, but it's very coincident. I will meet some new uh, individuals working, then I know, oh, there's another group here. And then uh, it's like all unexpected observation. And then when I walk back, then I found the group that I should be following. Yeah, so it's quite interesting. Then I like to take pictures also uh, during my field work whenever I see uh, like beautiful scenery. So these are some of my birds' biography. And then uh, the, my first Kologo sighting at the top right corner. And then like our field work during heavy rain. And then the double rainbow moments. And then some beautiful skies and sun rays coming through the forest canopy. Yeah, so and many more. Like, yeah, just share with you guys some of my photo dumps. And then maybe let's talk about my initial thought when I first get into conservation field. So my expectation was like, oh, I love animals so much. I want to work with animals because animals are simple. And I know maybe we, can, we all can agree we meet people that's just complicated to deal with. And sometimes it's very, very tired. <laughs> and then, so I feel like uh, animal is yeah, so just like, oh, I want to work with animals, I just got into conservation field. Yeah, so, but then I come to realize that I was wrong, right? 
conservation is all about humans because <laughs> we need to like awareness is very important. We need to like communicate with people and it's it's all about educating and raising people awareness about the com uh, importance of nature because um, I think like nature has their own um, self-sustaining cycle and then my, my personal thought is like every, every time when things come to nature I think human is the problem like and nature has the self-sustaining cycle but human we, we come in to disrupt the cycle and then take everything for granted yeah so I think a community engagement and then an educated community and people uh, who get to know the importance of nature we only can play our role in in, uh, in protecting our beautiful nature right? yeah so So the more time I spend with LPP, the more I come to see the LPP values and important. And negative, in, uh, I feel like the negative human market interaction is not only happening in Penang but also in other cities as well, especially with the unavoidable development. And this issue will be getting more and more common than we think. Just that probably in the future, not only monkeys will coming up, maybe other wildlife will coming out too. So. So that's where LBB came in, bridging the gap um, between human and primates' neighbor through conservation efforts and education. Just that um, we can be seen as a very niche and novel, um, yeah, a novel uh, things to people. So we often get questions from publics like how we sustain ourselves and what we exactly do. Yeah. So I feel like this thing is it is like a demand. Uh, to, to solve this issue and LBP is like the supply yeah so and also yeah so and I really I learned a lot being part of LBP I really learned a lot especially from Jolene he, she told me about like it's important to recognize conservation field as a proper profession uh, with like deserve job title instead of uh, instead of like every time when people talk about conservation field they just Think like oh it's an underpaid uh, should be a underpaid world and then we can't like sustain ourselves yeah so so why I still stay in LBP is because I would like to see like how our project goes uh, grows and then how our project and um, can really make impact and I I really want to see the positive impact of our bridge to crisis project and I we believe that every little action that we took and also uh, the right conservation efforts that we take will really create a positive impact to the to the conservation to the uh, yeah to the conservation yeah so I think that's all for me just want to share with you guys some of my biographies I taught a uh, biography I, I took during my field work and then yeah really thank you for those who come to visit us and talking with us today during our booth and then i hope you guys have a, a good time at Penang Hill yeah <laughs> maybe i guess pass back to Jolene all right thanks Jolene for sharing your thoughts all right so yeah i'm very right on time five minutes huh? i'm a very timekeeping person never late but always stay too late <laughs> okay all right so in the end i really hope that this short sharing session would give you some uh, motivation inspiration maybe cultivate a little bit more empathy when you see monkeys come towards your window and you know just pull and then touch the butt and then swear on your window and instead of you know cursing them you would think like ah maybe this just happened once in the blue moon and use different strategies uh, in terms of uh, guarding them away. There's many things that we do and just choose the humane method. Don't choose the inhumane method. That's the main message that we wanted to convey. Be humane. We are humans. This is why we are not featured on this list. Uh. If you're featured on this list, means uh, you're animal already. Alright, okay. <laughs> okay. 
So, uh, feel free to follow us on our social media. There's a QR code that links to our website and a YouTube page with lots of interactive videos because I'm also an environmental activity, uh, educator. So, we create a lot of uh, games, activities and videos trying to bridge the gap and educate as many people as possible. Alright, so I think that's it. Alright, right on time. Do we have any questions from the ground before we end the session? You mentioned that uh, these uh, monkeys are quite endangered. Do you have an estimated head count? How many are there? And I suppose the most common in Penang is the long tail macaques, is it? But I'm Penang resident, but I, uh, can you advise me to, how to spot the langurs? Where, where do I go and how to spot the langurs? I've never seen the langurs. I've seen the gibbons in Taman Negara, but I've not seen the, this thing in Penang. I mean, by and by and the past, by and by. Okay, so there's two questions in your question. First, uh, endangered in IUCN rate list. What's the hit count? To be honest, there's no one actually knows the number of monkeys, like for example, number of long tail macaques around Southeast Asia. No one knows. And how IUCN identify the status? First, is through research papers. So, research papers is not just about counting monkeys. Eh? Research paper also about genetics, about phylogenetics especially, and also about the uh, um, different types of uh, human approach studies, which includes anthropology. All right, like the ones that we have been doing is behavior study. So through all different research paper, they identify that uh, that particular species have been threatened by development, forest loss, and human impacted reasons. And this is how it contributed towards round table discussion among the researchers to pitch for up level of the status. Up level of status is serve good purpose for the researchers to continue get more grants. Like for us researchers, we rely a lot on international grants. They're able to fund our studies in order to prevent the species going towards critical and dangerous. All right. And second question, how to spot the ski langer? Eh? The ski langer, first thing is, they are not as noisy as macaques. Macaques, when they wake up in the morning, eh, they will do a lot of calls already. And I'm sure all of you know. And some of them will come down to the ground. The ski langers, uh, sometimes they will stay high up in the tree. But in the past, unfortunately, there's no the ski langer troops over there, overdeveloped. But come to Penang Hill. <laughs> Early morning, yeah? guide will bring you for nature walks and should be very easy lah to so spot the ski langer. This morning and yesterday morning. Yeah, they are like residents over here. Oh no, they are not doctor, no, they are diary, no. But this is also a very interesting question, yeah? From our studies, we also found out a very interesting observation. The ski langer started to behave a little bit nocturnal. They would only travel back to their sleeping tree after 7 or 8 p.m. Yeah, so when the sky is dark, it's considered no nocturnal only. Yeah? So this can be the influence of the street lamps, the buildings, the vehicle sound. So what makes them to cope with the urban corridors, the cable wires and the street lamps. Okay, so I hope this answers your question. Mostly is macaques, is it? You can find dusky languages over there from our Previous studies in Botanical Garden back in 2017, we have students from USM that did population survey in Botanical Garden. We have found the accessible track, yeah? the main road and the Curtis Crest, huh? the whole area. We found around 10 groups of dusky languages, you know. There's one even leucistic, means it's not black grey in colour, it's white in colour, not albino. Huh? It still has pigmentation, just lighter pigmentation. Yeah. So, we still need more people, not just scientists, but citizen scientists. Each of you can play in order to help scientists to grow the data, get more information for education and publication. All right. Okay. Any more questions from the ground? Uh, thank you. My name is Tony. I just want to ask you, uh, about, you're, you're talking about not feeding monkeys. We understand not feeding monkeys. Uh, I just want to... Because on the, on the gym track itself, we have a location where I think it's almost become a tradition for people to come and feed monkeys. And, and uh, we hikers are trying to solve that problem. We know it's bad, 
you know, we make some mess of the uh, And we try to find a way to solve it. Uh, in some way, like, because it's a very prominent location right next to the trash. And ironically, trash free hill every year goes through that place. Okay, so we, it's, it's not really a good nice thing. We need to do something about it. And I, I can say that we hikers would like to help to solve that problem somehow. Okay, now uh, the one thing is I want to know is what happens if monkeys eat human food? Okay, because we have a, a, a guy that's been doing it for years where he brings stale bread. Okay, he feeds monkeys below, uh, near the botanical garden and then he would somehow sneak up to that location slightly up here, feed another batch of monkeys. So that location now has a permanent colony of monkeys waiting to be fed. Okay, so how can we, uh, one, uh, you know, what happens when a monkey actually eats okay. Sometimes we see nasi lemak there, sometimes we see stale bread there, sometimes we see all sorts of cakes there. <laughs> so uh, what happens when monkey eat? Okay, that's my question, thank you. Thank you so much for the question, Tony. So we have just started the Green Light District project, right? So the first thing we did was interviews. So from the macaque approach, right, it shouldn't be the same like the dusky langer approach. Like for the dusky langer, they are not being fed for our second case study. Eh? So the first data we need to gather is their movement. Am I right? But for monkeys who are being fed by human continuously for years and years, especially if you say there's one uncle like this, yeah? so it's very important to get interviews. Interview the feeder, get their perspective. This is also a new study that we're going to start and I'm more than welcome to have you, Tony, to join us on mainland and see how we conduct the interviews and we can duplicate the same interviews to provide to your hikers group as well. Why interviews are important? Because we talk to the vendors uh, and the hikers in Jorotokuna, you know how they approach a feeder. Uh? <laughs> like for example, Joey is a feeder, you just walk over here and you just dump, dump something. Uh, then dump something, uh, they'll be like, oh, uh, I speak Hokkien, uh, later I translate, uh, so that can mimic a little bit realistic. Uh. Immediately it's like, go towards the feeder face, so what happened? No conflict. So in the end, there's no communication. I'm sure certain hikers will do the same thing. Yeah, so we wanted to approach as a mediator. Mediator also means that dress properly. Instead of dressing like a hiker, you have your binoculars, you have your long lenses, photographers can help. Then you have your big backpack. Duskies are here, is it? Ah, good. The duskies are ended. They are, are here to end my talk session. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. So dressing is also very important. This is what we have noticed so far. Our dress code and also our approach method in order to mediate the situation before it turns worse. Yeah. But Tony, we can definitely be in touch, and then I'm more than happy and really, really appreciative of the initiative, and then so that we can work to tackle more waste problem. Lah. Yeah. It's very important. Yes. And second question, right? Why they, okay, how, what will happen? Yeah, if they feed on human food, yeah? Sugar rush, ma. So when they feed on human food, they contain sugar, eh? glucose, things like that. If they feed on those food, they will become kind of like ADHD. ADHD not in the way that foraging in the trees, eh? ADHD in the way that creating more dispute. For macaques, they have year, uh, like daily, hourly, or every half an hour dispute. More dispute than the macaques in the wild. So they were distilled due to ranking. Like for example, uh, okay, like uh, I'm a macaque, so sorry uncle, you have to be a macaque for a moment. Uh. Okay, I'm eating a banana, you snatch my banana away. I can try to fight conflict with you for the next two hours and you know. Uh, every 15 minutes, uh, we'll find you to get into a negative interaction and then after that stop for a while and then shock shock go again. Uh, this is their daily routine when they are used to the ground, feeding human food. More human-like. More human-like. Yes, correct, correct. They are just like us because their social dynamic is so complicated. One group around 20 to 30 individuals. We can't even count one single group. Not like Langers. Langers, the most is like 16 individuals. And the urban Langers is even smaller, 8 to 9 individuals. And uncle, this is your lifer. 
of dusky layers. Amazing. Yeah, later you can go there to look at them. Yes, correct. The babies are orange in colour. Alright, okay. So, any more questions from the ground? Or is it time's up? Okay. Uh, like the angles are herbivores, is it? And then the macaques are omni, they'll eat anything. Anything that you feed them, including meats. Alright, so dusky langers, they are folivorous, means feed mainly on leaves, and then fruits, flowers, but doesn't mean that they are vegetarian. Eh? They also feed on termites and worms, invertebrates, because they feed on soil and tree bugs. So they will grab all these creepy collies and then to feed on. And for long tail macaques and pig tail macaque, yes, they are omnivores. They also feed on meat. For example, the studies being done by my PhD supervisor, Dr. Nadine, where her student found that the pig tail macaque is actually a very good biological controller for rats in palm oil plantation. They catch rats and enjoy on the spot. So long deal, maybe can do the same thing if to contribute towards a more positive perception towards the species. But we all need to work together, starting by educating people not to feed monkey. Trust me, you think it's common sense, huh? many people don't know. Seriously, many people of various professions, they have no idea. Okay, any more questions? If no, I know all of you want to go to see the dusky already. So maybe MC can end the set. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Jolene, for the interesting talk and also Jolene for sharing her experience. Now, we'd like to invite Dr. Jolene, our Penang Hill um, GM of Penang Hill Corporation, to present a souvenir to Dr. Jolene. Yeah. Thank you, Nato. Thank you. Thank you, Nato. Thank you, Dr. Jolie. And thank you, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful day ahead. Please enjoy the refreshment served at this corner. Thank you.